All right, welcome back once again, everybody. I am Colin Weaver, and these are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day. You get two questions each time. Here comes question number one. Okay, question number one today. Oh my word, this may be the longest question I've ever written. Uh, I'm gonna have to paraphrase. Um, you are a company, you work for a company that is using PIV-based authentication for desktop computer logins, as well as for controlling access to, say, different areas within the physical facility. Um, the organization wants to extend their PIV-based authentication infrastructure to the increasing number of mobile devices that are being deployed throughout uh, the organization. My question for you is, given the list of answer choices that I'm about to put up, which of them is gonna provide for the greatest amount of security while also allowing for the best user experience? So there's your answer choices. Uh, click pause if you need to, and when you are ready, click play and we can walk it through. All right, answer choice number one says that you should implement micro SD authentication tokens. While this is a possibility, uh, there's gonna be probably some issues with it uh, in that uh, one, you could off the surface say, well, lots of mobile devices like Apple devices don't support micro SD. So that's not a direct solution for those devices, even though the question doesn't really specify what type or what vendor of mobile device is being used. Um, and it's also plausible that you maybe could have some sort of an external adapter that you plug a micro SD uh, authentication token into. Um, but at that point, I'm really kind of talk, trying to talk myself into this being the right answer. It's not really a wrong answer, but there's a high degree of likelihood that it's not the best answer. So let's keep looking and see if there's a cooler choice than that. Choice number two says that you should use TOTP, which is time-based one-time passwords. Um, using either a key fob like you might see with say RSA Secure ID or with a mobile app like say like uh, a product from Symantec or say Google Authenticator or something like that. Um, totally usable, they're just not integrated into your PIV based authentication scheme. So this is unlikely to be the best answer because it really doesn't fit into the existing infrastructure. So it's also really not super seamless. Uh, I use Google Authenticator extensively and I'm regularly switching back and forth between that application and the, the site or whatever it is that I wanna log into so I can get my time-based code to go in and, and complete my authentication process. Same thing with some apps that I use with Symantec's product for going in and doing that. I have to you know, flip over to the Symantec product, get the code and then get back over and concatenate it with a, with a pen that I know uh, and you know, inside that 30 second window before you know, the code resets and then I have to do it all over again. So it works, but it's not integrated in with uh, PIV based infrastructures, so with uh, personal identity verification cards and uh, definitely not gonna think that this is the right answer either. So I'm gonna keep going. Choice number three says use derived PIV credentials stored securely on the device. Yes, okay. Derived PIV credentials are in essence a virtual PIV card that's on the device. The nice thing about a PIV card, or if you're a DOD, they tend to call them CAC cards. Um, actually, it's a CAC because the C is so saying the word card is somewhat redundant, but people still say cat cards, and I'm in a DOD community and people say cat card. Anyway, uh, a PIV card or a CAC uh, is a smart card that you have to plug into a reader on a device in order to be able to um, uh, log in or to access certain sites. Now, they can be read wirelessly, uh, it's not at nearly as common as using an actual physical reader, which is oftentimes either A, built into the computer, or B, is connected via, say, USB with a USB CAC reader or PIV card reader. Um, but all of those require the physical card. And the physical card solution really doesn't jive with mobile devices. Now, there are readers that you can connect to a mobile device, like a smartphone or a tablet, but they're very inconvenient. Um, they're, they're not, they're, 
you know, they're, they're prone to breaking. If you change phones and you were using some kind of a case that had a card reader built into it, then if the form factor of the phone changes or where the connectors change, then suddenly your case is useless now and the case might have been expensive. So there's all kinds of reasons why using a physical PIV card with a mobile device doesn't really play out. So what a derived credential is, is when you have the same thing as a PIV card in terms of the, uh, the private key and the public key and then the pin that controls access to the private key, except it's actually stored on the device itself and it's going to be stored securely on the device, either in a, a TPM, a trusted platform module, or a, TT, or a TEE, a trusted execution environment, or an SE, a secure element. Some sort of tamper resistant slash tamper proof, tamper resistant, um, storage location on the device where this stuff can be securely held. The end result of doing this is that you have an existing, well, you have an existing PIV card implementation, and then you use that PIV card implementation to actually provide derived PIVs. Because if we're really kind of distilling this down, a derived PIV is just another key pair um, that is, so the, the request for it is signed by the uh, private key that's on your PIV card. Okay, that's where the trust is built into it. And of course, the, there's the tree of trust that goes back to actually providing the authentication and trustworthiness of the private keys that are on your PIV card. So a derived PIV creates a virtual PIV uh, rather than you actually having to have a physical PIV on your mobile device. And uh, it's it's continuing to evolve and we'll see long term kind of how it all plays out, but that's the idea of being able to go in and do this, to leverage your existing infrastructure, which is kind of what the question said we wanted to do, um, as well as have it be very uh, seamless for the user. Because if it's a, if it's a virtual PIV that's on the phone, the, all they really need to know is, is their PIN to control access to that private key that's securely stored on the device. Uh, and that is very convenient. If you contrast that with trying to have a physical you know, uh, reader and then you'll, you know, plugging in your PIV card or your CAC um, to go in and gain access to your device, that's not particularly convenient. So that is the right answer. I know that was a lot of, just a bunch of wind that I was just throwing out there, but, uh, but that is the right answer that you're looking for. And then the very last choice is, is kind of really what stuff we were just talking about, to actually use a PIV card reader that's connected to the device. This is totally valid, totally legit, totally doable. It is, however, not the best answer in this question. So again, you know, with the CISSP, pick the best answer, not the you know, only correct answer, because that's not typically how it's going to be for you when you go to take the exam. All right, let's move on to question number two. Okay, you have been tasked with reducing the likelihood that nodes in your network can generate or forward packets with spoofed uh, source IP addresses. My question for you is, which of these answer choices is going to be the best way for you to accomplish that? Click pause, check them out, pick the right one, and then come back and we'll walk through. Choice number one says that you should use SNMP, the Simple Network Management Protocol, to create a list of allowed Macs on each virtual LAN. Um, no, no, no. Um, that all sounds incredibly fancy, except it would not do anything to help reduce the likelihood that people were generating spoofed IP packets. So that is completely the wrong answer. Uh, SNMP could very much go in and help you get a list of, of MAC addresses. Um, however, uh, having that list of MAC addresses isn't going to facilitate the um, ability to prevent uh, uh, spoofed IP packets. So definitely not the right answer choice. Okay, how about answer choice number two? It says that you should uh, create access control list entries on your router that only allow traffic so sourced from the local network segment. Now, that's totally, totally doable. Okay, it is also potentially very intensive uh, for you to go in and actually create all those individual ACLs that are gonna do that. But while technically possible, it probably is not the best answer. And I know that because I wrote this question, um, but it would work. Uh, you would just have to write a whole bunch of ACLs and trust that you weren't going to fat finger something and cause your own denial of service situation. So let's keep looking and see if we can find an answer that again is better than this one. Choice three says you should enable MLD snooping on your layer two switches. 
Again, that sounds real impressive. Uh, MLD snooping is multicast listener discovery snooping, which is typically associated with IP version 6. In IP version 4, uh, we called it IGMP snooping, uh, but in IP version 6, IGMP has become MLD and um, not going to do anything as far as preventing spoofed IP packets in your network. Uh, MLD snooping is going to help you have efficient forwarding of multicast traffic in your layer 2 topology with your switch that supports this, uh, and none of that has anything to do with spoofed IP packets. So, no, let's not choose that answer. This leaves us with the last choice, which is the right choice, and that says for you to go in and enable uh, reverse path forwarding on your routers. Yes. Reverse path forwarding is a pretty simple concept. A packet is traveling across the network and it comes to a router and it arrives on the router's interface. Okay. When that packet comes in on the router's interface, the router looks at the packet and looks at the source IP address. Where is this packet coming from? Okay. Now, this is secondary to his primary job, which is to look at the destination IP address, which is to figure out if he can help forward this thing. But before he does that, he wants to look at the source of it. Where is it coming from? And then he asks himself an important question. If I wanted to send a packet to this IP address that is in this source field, would I use this interface to send it out? If the answer to that question is yes, then that means that this packet is very highly likely legitimately sourced. If the answer is no, I would not use this interface in order to get pat traffic back to this particular source, then there's a very high degree of likelihood um, that the traffic is illegitimately sourced, aka spoofed, and therefore the router should not forward this packet on. Okay, now, beyond the scope of the CISSP, but there's, there's design considerations and things like that involved in this. But uh, reverse path forwarding is very much a way that we can go in and uh, help to reduce the likelihood of spoofed IP packets getting forwarded places in a network that they uh, should not be coming from. Um, and that can help you reduce the potential capacity for people to do denial of service related things. So that's your answer choice. That's the one you're looking for. All right. I felt long-winded today. Did it seem like that to you? Uh, did to me. Anyway, two questions done. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Uh, comment, ask questions, do all the other stuff down below, and I will try and get back to you. And thank you. See you next time. Bye.